Welcome, my children of the night, to another chilling, thrilling, vampire-killing episode of What Happened, the show where we look through every nook and cranny for that sweet, juicy wall meat of troubled video game development. When we last left the Belmont clan, we did so on Castlevania 64. It, well, well, just Castlevania, a game whose problems stemmed from the awkward teen phase of going from 2D gothic to 3D gothic. Our subject today, however, is a bit different and far more nuanced. The Lords of Shadow series is a contentious bit of the Castlevania bloodline, even though this trilogy of games is the most successful in terms of raw sales. Critics and fans took umbrage with the fact that the first Lords of Shadow took a bit too much inspiration from other franchises, most notably God of War and Shadow of the Colossus. The technical prowess, art, combat, and storytelling were all there though, and the game was such a big success for Konami, they immediately contracted the Spanish developer, Mercury Steam, to continue the story of Gabriel Big D Belmont. These sequels manifested as Mirror of Fate and Lords of Shadow 2, one of the most controversial chapters in the Castlevania saga for several reasons, with some of them not even due to the actual game. So grit your teeth, grab your whip, and kneel down in front of this wall for like 10 seconds and let me whisk you away in order to answer the question, what happened to Castlevania Lords of Shadow 2? But enough talk! How about you? Back in the mid to late 2000s, Konami flirted with the idea of bringing Castlevania onto HD consoles with an Alucard-focused trailer, which didn't result in anything. The last couple of Devil's Castle games didn't quite perform to Konami's standards, thus series shepherd Koji Igarashi was demoted, and a call went out to various studios to pitch a reboot. Mercury Steam answered this call and submitted a demo of a proposed 3D remake of Castlevania 1, starring Simon Belmont, no less. My gosh, now I know who I am! I'm Donkey Kong Jr. Now, while Konami upper management was impressed from a technical standpoint, they were still hesitant to greenlight such a project. However, Hideo Kojima saw something in Mercury Steam's work and wanted to help the studio in any way he could. Now, let's make this clear, he did not have a massive direct influence on its development, but instead offered some design advice for the main hero, Gabriel, and also oversaw the Japanese localization process, getting many Metal Gear alums to lend their voices. Truth be told, the most important thing Kojima did was shield Mercury Steam from Konami higher-ups. Mr. Nano Machines took responsibility for the game, letting Mercury Steam work in peace with minimal interruptions, and if Lords of Shadow failed, then it would be Kojima who would suffer Konami's wrath. Thankfully, that never happened. Well, it, it did, but mu much later and, and not over this. Mercury Steam's reboot became, and still is, the best-selling Vania title of all time. And while the game was not perfect by any measure, it was still an impressive reimagining of the world. Some were put off by the low sub-30 FPS frame rate, the static and unresponsive camera, and the game lacking its own fresh ideas. But its strong production values, art, and voice acting mixed with authentic, darker European horror trappings felt very genuine. Given the game's cliffhangery ending, the story was planned with sequels in mind, and with the strong sales, two projects were put into production almost immediately. Since Mercury Steam already had core design and technology to work off of, both Mirror of Fate and Lords of Shadow 2 came together fairly quickly. But unbeknownst to most, things were progressing even faster within the dark bowels of Konami. Silent Hill. Kojima was incredibly busy working on Metal Gear Solid 5 and trying to fend off encroaching pressure and meddling from that Konami upper management. Despite some recent success, Konami were seeing even more success with pachinko and mobile games, and made on much smaller budgets than their current AAA slate. More on that later. Why are we still here? 
just to suffer. With Kojima occupied, Konami had more say in Lords of Shadow 2's direction, but this wasn't the overbearing curse of death I'm sure you're all expecting. Konami Europe's Dave Cox, who had worked on Castlevania ever since Symphony of the Night and was the Lords of Shadow trilogy producer, spoke on this issue in a 2018 interview with Eurogamer. Because Mr. Kojima had associated himself with the project, it meant people in Japan weren't worried about a Western developer taking on such a big franchise. That really helped on the first game. On the second game, they had more oversight. There was more pressure involved because it was an important project for the company. There was a lot of expectation, but nevertheless, Konami as a company was supportive of its development staff, its teams, and its marketing people. I've got nothing bad to say about Konami, actually. I had a memorable 17 years working there. So while the higher ups were more of, but still not a major factor, decisions were made to rectify the problems critics and fans had with the first game, but not all of them were the correct ones. The positives first. They unlocked the camera, giving the player full control at all times, which had the added benefit of feeling more distinct from God of War. They switched up the game's progression from a very linear, forward-moving adventure to letting the player explore two massive environments that were connected in multiple ways, each one hiding dozens of upgrades and gear. The graphics saw a bump, the combat was fleshed out even further, and lots of characters, new and old, were woven into the narrative. Unfortunately, the desire to stand apart from competitors resulted in the team taking some risks, which, while commendable, could have used a bit more thought and playtesting. The game instituted stealth as a new component, with Dracula needing to avoid certain powerful enemies along the course of his bloody quest. He does this by either cowering behind boxes, walls, and using his ability to transform into an adorable ratty. While certainly thematically appropriate, since in most fiction, Dracula can anamorph into various creatures of the night, this change, though, was not well received by some. The main problem was that this was not finely tuned Metal Gear Solid stealth with nuanced alert phases and multiple ways to avoid an enemy. If you were seen, even once, you had zero options depending on the situation, and once caught, you'd have to start the entire encounter over from the beginning. Both Dave Cox and the game's director, Enric Alvarez, admitted in the same Eurogamer interview that while well-intentioned, these sequences were a mistake. The stealth sections are actually a small part of the game. Not even 6 or 7%, but some reviews made it look like that was all that matters. I never agreed with that. It was like the game was trash because a few sections weren't the best ideas in the world. I fully admit it. If I could go back in time, we would solve this in a different way. At the same time, the main course of the game is combat, exploration, and character development. So when I read some reviews focusing exclusively on stealth, I thought, hey, have you seen the rest of the game, which is 90 percent of it? That was a bit unfair. We were taking a risk. We were fully aware we were taking a risk, but clearly we were wrong. One of the things that exacerbated this problem further was that Mercury Steam front-loaded the game with a lot of these risks. After a short but impressive opening tutorial, you are then thrusted into the future where Dracula is in a very weakened state. A brief but awkward first-person section is then introduced, followed immediately by a stealth sequence, rat transformation, and instant fail states. Suffice to say, the game starts off very unevenly, let's leave it at that. The futuristic setting was another risk, and one many people weren't all that enthusiastic over. While this twist plays well as a shocking end credit scene, having 50% of a Castlevania game take place in industrial labs, warehouses, and sewers made it feel a lot like the dozens of generic action games flooding the market. One last mistake, although minor, lay in the story. Taken on its own, Lords of Shadow 2's narrative is filled with various plot holes, with some events, MacGuffins, and characters getting little to no explanation. That's because they expected fans to fill in these holes by playing through Mirror of Fate, which fleshed out these story elements. Lords of Shadow 2 just 
goes, assuming you played through the 3DS game or the HD version which was released just a few months prior and makes no attempt to catch up anyone who didn't. We call this the Kingdom Hearts Effect. Uh. I don't understand what's going on. So you can see that Mirror of Fate, while solid, was a bit of a confusing release timeline-wise and could have been better served focusing on a separate, unexplored pocket of Mercury Steam's rebooted universe rather than being integral to fully enjoying Lords of Shadow 2's story. It's understandable that the team wanted to shake things up and not retread on what they did the first time around, and while they knew some fans would be taken aback, none of them anticipated the backlash that would befall Lords of Shadow 2 upon release. Dave Cox explained. It caught everybody by surprise. In hindsight, perhaps it was to be expected. Internally, the reviews within Konami were very positive. I would go and present the game to senior management in Japan, including Mr. Kojima, and got very strong, positive feedback. So yeah, it did catch us all a bit by surprise. It's not nice to be on the end of that kind of criticism, because you spend two, two and a half years of your life working on something you really believe in and you're really passionate about. And when people don't like it, it's a bit of a kick in the teeth. But you have to accept it. You have to accept that a lot of people didn't like what we did. A lot of people did like what we did though. The criticism we got on the game from the press was all of our making, honestly. That criticism certainly did result in lower scores over the first game, but they were not disastrous by any means. However, when you combine them with the game's unfortunate release window, February 2014, then that concretely hurt the game's financial potential. Despite releasing more than like three months after the release of the Xbox One and PS4, Lords of Shadow 2 never saw an updated version to take advantage of those new consoles. This was another contributing factor as to why its sales weren't nearly as impressive at launch as they were for Shadows 1. Dollars were obviously being spent elsewhere. Pleasure doing business with you, sir. It's still one of the top selling Castlevania games of all time, mind you. It just had a very long tail rather than a strong start. The game not getting this new lease on life wasn't all that surprising though, as Konami's business plan was in the middle of pivoting. Hideki Hayakawa, producer of the smash hit mobile game Dragon Collection, was set to become Konami Digital Entertainment's new president, with the change being made public a few months later. This move then heralded MGS5 as the last major AAA console video game Konami would release, something Dave Cox had a few thoughts on. Konami decided… Let's just say it wanted to go in a different direction in terms of development. It's one of the reasons why the studio I was heading up closed down. They wanted to move more into mobile. At the time, it was simpler to make a clean break, for me personally and for the studio. I don't think Konami knew at the time what they wanted to do or where they wanted to go. They obviously had Metal Gear in development, but there wasn't a vision at the top of the company. It was painful for me from a personal point of view because it was clear there wasn't a role for me anymore. So I decided after talking to the senior management there that it would be better if I moved on, which was very difficult for me after being there for 17 years and achieving so much. I started off as a lowly assistant product manager and ended up producing a successful Castlevania series. Now typically, our story might end there. A game came out, there were some issues, and the publisher decided to move on to doing… Yeah, not much actually. But then, just days after the game swooped into store shelves, an article was published in a Spanish newspaper, which cited an anonymous source who had worked at Mercury Steam. The former employee painted a very different and not very positive portrait of the studio, citing a workplace rife with discord, with many employees being unhappy due to Enric's alleged controlling abusive nature. The article also claimed that due to Lords of Shadow 2's embarrassing, mostly negative reviews, that several walkouts and mass firings occurred or would be occurring at Mercury Steam as well. It was a company that was imploding from the inside out, and was only a matter of time before it closed its doors. 
I'm sure many of you out there remember this article. I sure did. But then I started looking into it and I couldn't find a whole lot of evidence to support its claims. There were never any mass layoffs or walkouts at Mercury Steam, something that almost always gets reported on. Secondly, if a particular person at the top is unpleasant to work with, typically there's multiple corroborating accounts like what we saw with Brendan McNamara. Not so here. Finally, seven years on, Mercury Steam is still releasing titles and working with various publishers, so it's business as usual. In that Eurogamer interview, the Spanish article was addressed by both Cox and Alvarez. No truth whatsoever to that, but let me just say one thing. I worked with Enric when I was at Konami, and I've come back to join them as an independent person working at the studio. If working here was a living hell, I promise you I wouldn't be here. I love working here. These guys are amazing, they're passionate, and they love what they do. I certainly wouldn't come back here if it was as described by that article. Sometimes common sense is the least common of sense. We are in an age when anybody can post what he or she thinks on the internet and that can be read by millions of people. This is good in itself and it's changing our society. We've been in business for 12 years, hundreds of people have worked here, and all those years only one person complained about me, the studio, and the project. And by the way, I have to say it was one guy who was fired and he was taking revenge. It was simple as that. It turned into a big shitstorm against me personally and against the studio. I'm thinking maybe despite all the technology that surrounds us, we haven't changed that much since the Middle Ages. Both Cox and Alvarez go into even more detail in that Eurogamer interview, so give it a read if you're interested. Obviously, that former employee certainly had a grudge against Alvarez, but I can't find a single other claim or complaint against Mercury Steam at all. In fact, when you consider that they were trusted by Nintendo, fuck around and find out what happens, of Japan on Samus Returns, it pokes some holes in that narrative. Nintendo usually double and triple checks who they work with and keeps a constant eye on their progress. See my recent Metroid Prime episode for more on that. After Samus Returns, Mercury Steam went on to develop and self-publish their online shooter Space Lords, and most recently have inked a deal with 505 Games on a brand new upcoming project. While no studio is run perfectly and it's completely plausible that Alvarez is an overbearing boss, as it stands, it seems like the claims against the studio were at the very least over-exaggerated. There was definitely a confluence of developmental decisions, poor PR, and changing business practices within Konami that left a negative miasma which still shrouds Lords of Shadow 2 to this day. The rebooted universe, while not every fan's cup of tea, could have gone on to even greater things, but because Konami moved away from traditional game development, its path was cut short. Nowadays, aside from the surprisingly solid Netflix show and a few collections, he shouldn't die. Yes, fuck you. The vampire killer has seen little use over the last seven years. Although, if you do want to experience more classic interpretations of the source material, there are non-Konami alternatives. We leave on Dave Cox, who really seems like a massive fan of the series, who reflected on his time with it rather fondly. Internally at Konami, many people wanted to do something with Castlevania, but others felt it wasn't going anywhere, that its day was done. Literally, it was going to be shelved. Castlevania is finished, we're not interested in moving forward with the brand anymore. The whole idea of a reboot to do something that would find a more mainstream audience was a real challenge to get off the ground, especially as I was a gaijin in a Japanese corporation with no track record to speak of in terms of game development back then. It was thanks to Kunio Nio, who was the president of Konami Europe at the time, and Mr. Kojima that we were given that opportunity. Well, we can only hope that in the future, Kojima can convince Konami upper management that Oh, God damn it. If you process any knowledge of other video game or movies with cursed development cycles, howl them out in the comments below, leave a cryptic message on my Twitter, or swing your way over to the Flophouse VIP Patreon castle and become a big boss and nominate the subject you'd like me to drain the blood of in a future episode. See you next time, and thanks for watching.